In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hyperbole. Hyperbole is an obvious and intentional exaggeration. It is an extravagant statement or figure of speech not intended to be taken literally. Hyperbole comes from the Greek word meaning to overcast, to throw out over, to overthrow in order to pull back. Hyperbole is a literary advice that uses exaggeration for emphasis. Sometimes, sometimes hyperbole is used for a humorous, humorous effect, as in Paul Bunyan's tale where we're, we're told, well now, one winter it was so cold the geese flew backward and all fish moved south and even the snow turned blue. Late at night, it got so cold that all spoken words froze solid before they could be heard. People had to wait until the sun come up to find out what folks said the night before. Sometimes, sometimes hyperbole is used to shock, to stir, to cause dis-ease. Flannery O'Connor, the profound Southern writer, said, I use the grotesque the way I do because people are deaf and dumb and need help to see and hear. She used hyperbole in her writing to turn a brighter light on, to crank up the volume on her message. Jesus often used the same technique. There are several passages in the gospel narratives that scholars have labeled the hard teachings of Jesus. And these lessons typically rely on exaggerated metaphors to illustrate his point. Jesus says harsh words and uses graphic graphic description. He overcasts in order to get people's attention, in order to startle them out of their complacency, in order to cure them of their blindness, their deafness, their inability to make godly sense. Today's lesson for the Ma Gospel of Mark is one of those hard teachings one of those places where Jesus uses hyperbole to make a critical point to help us save ourselves from a bad way. In a disjointed conversation with the disciples, Jesus advises them that to create an impediment, to foster any kind of limitation or liability, to place an impediment, Pediment, or even a subtle obstacle in the way of another person's relationship with God is a bad business and should be avoided, should be avoided with serious intent. To put an obstacle, to be an obstacle in someone's faith life brings a strong and unpleasant response from God. To be careless or casual or oblivious to one's effect on another's belief is unwise. To be arrogant or deliberately provoking or have with an inflated sense of certainty to be over pious or filled with self-importance in such a way as to undermine a person's understanding of God offends the Creator mightily. Eroding people's trust in God, shaking their confidence in the power and presence of God in the world, wounding their rest and respite in a community of faith is counted as sin. The behaviors and attitudes 
like these lead people astray. They create doubts. They increase distance between humans and their loving master. And these obstacles make relationships between God and people and his beloved much more difficult. And that difficulty puts people in danger of losing their connection with the source of all goodness. It puts people in peril. It puts people in the position of being cut off from the living water, the abundant life, the love and the health and the mercy of Almighty God, serving as a stumbling block, a tripping up place for another person's relationship with God can have unforeseen and dire consequences on their lives, and God looks unkindly on such callous behavior. In his conversations with the disciples, Jesus wants them to understand the intensity and the gravity of being a stumbling block to people who would want to be believers. And he says it strongly, don't do that. Don't be that. Do not be that stumbling block. Better to cut off your hand. Better to cut off your foot. Better to tear out your eye. Be maimed. Be lame. Be blind rather than find yourself cast out, cast apart from the loving presence of God. Jesus is clear and he is urging internal reflection leading to a discernible shift of behavior. But my friends, we get startled and we get shaken and our attention is grabbed by this grotesque and this hyperbole, but unfortunately, we often get stuck there we get stuck in the mayhem and the maiming and the millstone and the drowning and the limping and the burning. And we stay with those images and we forget the literary device. And we forget that the word hell used in the gospel is translated Gehana. And Gehana was this large dump outside of Jerusalem, right outside the walls of Jerusalem where people brought their refuge and brought their trash, and the worms didn't die. Well, individual worms die, but as a species, the worms thrive because there was refuge being brought there all the time. And the fires were never quenched because there was always refuge to be burned. Gehana, being outside of the temple, outside of Jerusalem, is being separated from God. Jesus is saying, don't put yourself in the position to be separated from God in that way. Don't put yourself in the position of separating others from God in that way. We hear the strong teaching, but we stay in the images instead of going to the bigger picture, instead of getting to the real point. How? How? How are we being obstacles? How are we being stumbling blocks to other people in their relationship with God? And how can we not be that? How have we been stumbling blocks and obstacles in our communities of faith? Certainly, the big disastrous examples come to mind. There was a time there was a time when communities of faith so fervent in their belief of God burned heretics at a stake, tied to a pyre. That's an obstacle. That's a stumbling block to those people's faith. There was a time when good Christian soldiers from Europe and England marched into the desert to compel people with faith, and we lost our footing in that part of the world for hopefully not forever, but certainly for centuries. There have been more examples of Christian soldiers so fervent in their faith serving as stumbling blocks. The Westboro Church arrives on church doorsteps and 
wave around hate-filled, hate-filled signs. And would-be believers look on that and say, if that's Christianity, I want no part of it. We have recent examples where the Episcopal Church refuses to baptize a baby because they disapprove of the parent's lifestyle. There are churches who are turning blind eyes to financial malfeasance, inappropriate behavior between clerics and members. There are places, and are we one of them, where the liturgy is so precious we don't open it up to newcomers so they understand where they are in the service. Are there churches, are we one of them, where we are so excited to see one another we forget to welcome the newcomer, the visitor, and incorporate them? Are we a stumbling block to their way in? At King's Chapel in Boston, Massachusetts, an Anglican congregation started in 1686 hangs this prayer. O oh God, make the door of this house wide enough to receive all who need human love and fellowship, narrow enough to shut out all envy, pride, and strife. Make its threshold smooth enough to be no stumbling block to children nor to strained feet, but rugged and strong enough to turn back the tempter's power. God, make the door of this house the gateway to thine eternal kingdom. It's just beautiful and lovely, and it's written in direct response to the gospel passage we heard. And would that it be on every church door. But beloved, it occurs to me that in order for a church community to be that kind of door and that kind of threshold and that kind of gateway, the people who show up have to be, have that kind of door, that kind of threshold, that kind of gateway in their own households. So what is tripping us up and causing us to stumble in the way we order our own households? And in order for households to have wide doors and smooth thresholds and beautiful gateways, the members have to be the same. So in our own cells, in the doorway and the threshold and the gateway of our souls and psyches, what is causing us to be a stumbling block and an obstacle to others in their access to God. How do I and how do we look to the care and the contemplation of our own soul and psyche and heart? Am I so certain in my beliefs that I'm not leaving room for another's interpretation in their beliefs? And in so being that, Am I a stumbling block? Am I so anemic in my prayers that I am not presenting a compelling, centered presence to others and in so doing, being a stumbling block? Am I silent too often in my commitment to stand with the vulnerable and in so doing, am I being a stumbling block? Am I too harsh in my assessments of others. Yes. Yes, I am. In forgetting that I may not know the trials and tribulations of their lives and I may not see their wonderful gifts. Am I too harsh in my assessments and others and therefore coming across as a hypocrite to God's love? Being at odds with what I say I believe the kindness and mercy of Christ. Where should I put my focus? Where should we put our focuses to be that wide door, to be that smooth threshold, to be the beautiful gateway into the kingdom of God? Beloved, this is our prayer for Jesus' hard teaching. Blessings on our contemplation. 
blessings on our contemplations as we consider these things, and then blessings on our renovation, blessings on the rejuvenation to the doorways of our souls. Amen.